The first time that I met Yari was actually in New York. We were shooting for them and Teen Vogue. What's that? My apartment bell. Ah! Do you want to see? Sorry, living in New York. <laughs> <laughs> Hey Team Vogue, this is Yari Jones and... It's Monroe Bergdorf. And this is some of our first. First person I came out to, probably my parents, and I didn't even realize that I was coming out. I just told my parents that I liked the person in my class who was also my bully. But, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that wasn't great, but I had a, I had a big crush on him. And um, I just told my parents, I didn't think that there was anything wrong with liking um, someone who was the same gender as you or same yeah. perceived gender as you. And then I was very quickly told, you know, this isn't a thing, you're confused, um, you know, boys don't like other boys. So Yari, who was the first person that you came out to? I think I was always coming out to the world. <laughs> <laughs> I think when I was younger, I was telling everybody that I was a girl. I would be like, I'm a girl, or I'm pretty, or I'm like, you know, I would just use words that would obviously be describing, you know, femininity. And, you know, I think, like you were saying, when we're like, everybody was telling me I wasn't, you know, the, that's when the policing started. But I think I was coming out very young, you know, like, I want to say, like, toddler up. So Yari, what was your first queer awakening? Oh my God, I've had so many. <laughs> I feel like I've had so many in like first, like throughout, you know, different identities, uh -huh. right? My first, let's say gender queer awakening. Um, when I was a kid, right? I used to have sleepovers. Everybody, all the boys would wear pajamas and I would wear a big t-shirt, you know? Cause I thought it was pretty. I thought it was like I'm wearing a dress. So Monroe, what was your first queer awakening? I don't think I've ever really had a queer awakening. I think I've always just been very, very, very queer. So the first time that I posted my authentic self on the internet was when I was about 23. I thought at that point that I had to be sexy all the time. I just thought, mm -hmm. you know, that I had to, you know, be sexy and attractive and traditionally beautiful if I was going to be taken seriously um, as a woman and that's such an awful thing that I am so glad is now being called out. I'm glad that I'm who I want to be now but at that point it was very um, you know who I thought I had to be. Yeah um, in that regard you know of making it personal um, I actually really never came out to the internet or came out publicly. Um, I think I kind of just transitioned it non-verbally, you know, whether that was just, you know, adding more feminine things in my wardrobe or calling myself, you know, she, her in my post, but it was never like a formal come out. I thought that if I put that out there and made this huge statement, then people would try to take it away from me, right? And it was the one thing in my life that I was so sure about. The first time that I saw myself on screen in a way that was accurate and authentic was probably Paris is Burning. Seeing Octavia St. Laurent just be herself unashamedly. I don't know, you could just see it in her eyes that this wasn't, this wasn't a game. And she allowed me to dream as a person. And I've always just felt a real connection with her. Um, and I, I'm so lucky. I think we're so lucky as well with what we're doing now is what she dreamed of then. And I get goosebumps all the time thinking about that. That's totally like, absolutely like my same sentiment. Um, I think, you know, that cast in general, right, was really the introduction to transness that a lot of us had, you know, it mimicked the life that I was, you know, living, you know, young, New York, you know, doing everything in and out of the ball scene or trying to, you know, get into like this like fab life. You know, I, I just love the way that these girls navigate it. 
The first thing that made me want to be an activist, oh, I don't really know. I think it was just a build up of tension within my body. I just felt really, really, really pissed off and I couldn't tell why. I just didn't have anywhere to put it. I just realized that um, I could use my platform in a way that was beneficial to my community. It wasn't really until everything blew up after the Charlottesville riots for me in 2017 that I realized, oh, actually I'm breaking out of the echo chamber now and I can reach a, a bigger audience that actually is where the change needs to take place. The catalyst of my activism, you know, when I, I was like, oh, this is what I am. I think it, it, it had to be um, the, the countless, I think, trans murders that were happening. And it became a point where my activism was being, you know, brought out because I needed to survive, you know, this. I needed to survive what was happening, right? So it wasn't even like, oh, I'm gonna like, you know, this is a cause that I'm gonna like be fighting for. It was like, these girls look just like me. What's the difference, you know? I need to be doing work so I can keep myself, my sisters, my wife alive, you know? Um, that's where it really started, especially when like Elon Nettles was killed. Like, it shook me to my core, like how close it was, you know? Um, you know, what she looked like, you know? Like anything I do, whether it's, you know, my online platform or whether it's a fashion campaign, I'm going to tie in that activism in a way that's going to um, humanize, you know, trans women, especially black trans women. So the first <clears throat> protest that I attended, it was after a woman called Lucy Meadows, who was a primary school teacher. Um, uh, she actually took her own life after a national newspaper in the UK uh, outed her and, mm. um, it basically sent the mob her way and all of the teachers um, were up in arms that a trans woman was allowed to be a teacher in a primary school. And she took her own life. And this was one of the, it's, um, one of the big newspapers in the UK, one of the, the most read, um, unfortunately. And um, we marched and we protested and held a vigil outside um, the offices of the newspaper. And I feel really emotional even like talking about it because I think it, it was just a moment for me um, personally, but also it was a moment for the community because it made me realize, you know, that society just really doesn't want us here. Yeah, I'll always, you know, be able to draw power from that moment as heartbreaking as it was. It really woke me up. It made me realize that lives are at stake. It's not just about people not wanting you to look a certain way or to be involved. It's about people genuinely not caring if you live or die. I 100% agree. Wow. My first protest, I, I think it was Elon Nettles and it was such a complex um, experience for me because of me being a dark-skinned girl, me being a plus-size woman, me being a trans girl. You know, when you are protesting with those, with that identity, those intersections, um, you're most likely to be targeted. Yeah. Those. You know, I, I could be in a center and there's a hundred people around me and somehow somebody was going to physically cross my boundary, right? Um, that was enforcement. So I stopped going and I realized that I could protest other ways, um, whether that was trying to find funding or whether I was trying to make aware of, um, you know, these situations or these murders that were happening the best I can using my platform. I completely agree with you. I mean, personally, I don't like protests for myself. I don't think that that's part of necessarily, that my activism, my activism isn't hinged on protests. I see protests as what people that have the most privilege should be doing. Absolutely. They're least likely to be attacked. 
So when you say that, I completely understand and I, I know that a lot of girls feel that way. Um, it's a big deal for a lot of girls to even be in public. Absolutely. Um, especially in the early stages of a transition, it's so overwhelming um, to, you know, have all of these eyes at you and, you know, to also be thinking that eyes are on you even when they're not. So when they literally are, it's extremely overwhelming. My first billboard was definitely Calvin Klein, which just happened recently. And um, it was fantastic to see a marginalized body loved and celebrated and put on the biggest, most expensive real estate in New York. <laughs> um, and really like, you know, have that moment of like, this is what the future can look like in fashion and just in general. So my first brand deal is actually my first billboard as well was with Uniqlo and um, it was the first time that I actually really got to talk about my identity um, rather than just be a visible trans body, um, got to talk about my experiences living in London and being a black trans woman and, you know, being queer as well. And I think a lot of people didn't realise that, you know, there's straight trans people, there's queer trans people where, you know, the gender and sexuality are different. And so um, it was it was amazing just seeing um, myself, you know, all over like Oxford Street, which is kind of like Times Square. Yeah. I'm so glad that, you know, you got to feel that as well. I mean, just to see your moment and see you up on that billboard was just, you know, it's such an important moment for so many black trans women. Um, and seeing you shine, I, I, honestly, I'm I'm so happy for you. You you deserve it so much. Um, you're just an incredible person and so beautiful. So thank you. <laughs> so my first like viral post thing that I written was for Essence, and it was an open letter to. Victoria's Secret about some of their comments <laughs> um, regarding plus size women and trans women. Um, it was like, the I think it was one of the first times where like my voice wasn't, you know, edited to like interview style or edited in a way where another, you know, journalist was kind of like creating my words and meshing them into something that was like just me and they put it out there and it was incredible and it got the response that I wanted to get. Yeah, it really started a conversation, big conversation um, around Victoria's Secret. I think the first time that I went viral was um, the situation with L'Oreal in 2017. And um, up until that point, I don't think a lot of people had really heard about white privilege or, um, you know, white supremacy seemed like a very extreme concept that people, white society didn't necessarily think that they um, participated in. So to have conversations that we've been speaking about as black people, as trans people, as black trans people, um, you know, within our echo chamber and that break out into the mainstream, um, um, I think it was a I think it was a, a moment for us to you know really have these conversations and I don't necessarily think that people were ready for them three years ago but then cut into the future um, three years um, into the future from that moment and we're now seeing what I said back then um, you know everybody's saying it now and I am so happy amen to that <laughs> Thank you so much, Teen Vogue, for listening to and being part of our firsts. I'm Monroe Bergdorf and... I'm Yari Jones, and it's been such a pleasure. <laughs>